Good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are uh, in the world. Welcome everyone uh, to this roundtable discussion on art as resilience in the Anthropocene. Uh, my name is Ethan Michelson, uh, and I'm in the departments of sociology and East Asian languages and cultures here at Indiana University. And I'm also the academic director of the Indiana University China Gateway office in Beijing. I'm really delighted to host this semester roundtable event. Uh, we only have an hour, uh, and I want to turn it over as soon as possible to our amazing panelists. I mean, this is truly a dream team. Uh, they are Maya Kovskaya, who is joining us from California, uh, although she is on the faculty at Chiang Mai University in Thailand, where she lives. Um, we're just fortunate to be able to schedule her for this event while she's making a brief trip uh, to the U.S., um, also with us is Pierrat Pia Pongwiwat, uh, an acclaimed multidisciplinary artist whose work has been exhibited all over the world uh, and who is actually joining us from Thailand right now, where it is, it is currently one o'clock in the morning. So thank you, uh, Pierrat, for that. Uh, and uh, also uh, on our third panelist, Andrew Yang. No, not, not that Andrew Yang, um, but Andrew Yang, the transdisciplinary artist uh, who is joining us from Chicago, where he is also on the faculty at the School of the Art Institute uh, of Chicago. Uh, they are internationally renowned, award-winning artists, curators, uh, and scholars. Because introducing them one by one would take too long, uh, I'm gonna post links to their bios in the chat box uh, and this will preserve more time for our panelists uh, who are a lot more interesting than I am. Uh, I just wanna quickly point out, um, you know, sort of make a personal note here that I've been friends with uh, Maya Kovskaya for over 25 years from back when we were grad students doing research in, in Beijing. Uh, before moving to Thailand, she lived in China and India uh, for decades uh, as an amazingly active scholar of and uh, participant in the art worlds um, there. Uh, but this is the first time uh, we've collaborated professionally, and I just want to say uh, how excited I am uh, about that. Um, part of what the three panelists do um, as artists, curators, and scholars is to represent and chronicle the plight of our planet uh, and all of its inhabitants, human and non-human species alike, uh, in the Anthropocene. Um, but they also go far beyond this by offering us ways to reimagine the shared plight uh, of all life on earth. And in so doing, to give us resilience through art, which is the, the topic of this, um, uh, of this, of this round table. Just a, a, a few quick shout outs before I turn it over to the panel. I wanna thank uh, the IU College of Arts and Sciences Themester Series, um, as well as IU Global. Uh, that's the Office of the Vice President for International Affairs for sponsoring uh, this event. Uh, I want to thank Molly Fisher and uh, Lucero uh, Guyen uh, in our gateway office in Mexico City um, and uh, Peter Bunjaran in our gateway office in Bangkok. Um, they've, they've really, I mean, they would, it, this wouldn't be happening without their help and support. Uh, above all, I want to thank our panelists um, for taking the time to share their art and insights uh, with all of us. Um, each panelist uh, will speak for 15 minutes. Um, and, and since that will leave us with only about 10 minutes or so um, for Q&A uh, and discussion, uh, I'm, I'm going to interrupt the speakers with warnings um, about how much time uh, they have left. Um, for the Q&A, um, you'll notice that there's a box um, at the bottom of the Zoom screen. It says Q&A. So um, we'll be collecting questions for the Q&A and discussion there in the Q&A box, not in the, uh, in the chat box. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me turn it over to our, uh, to our panelists, starting with Maya Kovskaya. Wonderful. Thank you so very, very much, Ethan. It is amazing to be here and a great pleasure to have brought some wonderful artist friends with me to share with you. Um, oh, I did it again. Sorry, Maya. Thing keeps going to the end. So give me a second to reset the talk. 
to the very first screen. There we go. <laughs> My iPad stand did not arrive, so we're dealing with a little bit of wiggliness. All right, so I hope everyone can see and hear clearly. And um, I'm used to teaching students who, for whom English is a second language, so I've gotten in the habit of speaking very slowly and articulately. So I hope I uh, don't speak <clears throat> that way too much for you guys. I'm very happy to be here to give a talk today about art as resilience in a multi-species Anthropocene and talk about reimagining our shared future together in a more than human world. Sorry, I'm still having trouble with the cursor working. So our round table is curated by me and the Amar Mundi Multispecies World Making Lab. And I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement that we acknowledge that the land on which we speak, work and live belongs to all Terran beings, past, present and future, including especially the very many diverse indigenous peoples who made lives and built worlds on this earth long before there were nations or states. Um, I won't repeat the speakers of the event, but I would like to give a thank you to our host, Indiana University's Thermester Global Perspectives on Resilience, the webinar series co-sponsored by Indiana University's Global Gateway Network. We really appreciate you for making it possible. So I wanna start out by talking about popular culture because nowadays uh, young people are probably more aware than anyone else on this planet that the world is in trouble. And our popular culture is filled with apocalyptic stories about the end of the world. Young people are keenly aware that they have inherited a broken natural world in which our planet's life support systems are on the brink of destabilization. So our modern way of life has caused us serious problems that we're going to be contending with probably for the rest of our existence as a species. This conversation will explore narratives and visions of the Anthropocene and art from Asia, where the violence of the Anthropocene, which is a fancy new word for our planet's current epoch of ecological crisis, including climate collapse, global heating, mass extinction, caused by world-breaking human activity, is rapidly unfolding. I must see some images of popular cultural post-apocalyptic uh, visual culture that we're all real familiar with. Now, art offers a critical space to reimagine what it means to be human in a more than human natural world of myriad other life forms that we need to survive. We need new narratives of what it means to be a good, uh, uh, to live a good, meaningful and fulfilling life as ecological citizens in balance with nature so that we can overcome our paralysis and begin to heal the broken world of the Anthropocene and have some kind of regeneration. We urgently need new visions of who we are and our place in the world as individuals, as societies, and as a species to help us stay with the trouble as a feminist philosopher of science, Donna Haraway would, would say. We need to stay with the trouble of the Anthropocene rather than abandoning hope or fantasizing that some techno fix will save us. For at least the past 12,000 years, humans have been transforming the landscapes of our planet with technologies like fire tools and processes of domestication of other species, grains, livestock, companion animals, but also other humans, women enclosed in the domestic sphere, colonized people, people who were kidnapped, captured, enslaved, and had their lives stolen to labor for others. During the period of human evolution, which is a tiny speck in the history of the planet, uh, there have been multiple milestones during which the human impact on the environment grew. And so debates about the Anthropocene focus on these different periods, ranging from the beginning of fire to the Neolithic and the, the spread of farming or sedentary agriculture um, and the beginning of the age of colonialism with the indigenous genocides that went along with it. Others argue for the industrial revolution or the use of fossil fuels that transformed our energy uses. 
And a great many of the geologists and hard scientists have fixated on the 1950s and a period called the Great Acceleration when there was this huge uptick in human uh, population and use of resources and consumption, multiple processes marking a dramatic shift in the ways in which humans interacted with the world. There's a whole debate about whether or not we could even have a good Anthropocene and what would that even mean? Is there a safe one? Uh, or are we headed towards a fundamental rupture? In spite of the violence of, of oppression that humans have committed throughout our existence, we've also had a history of mutual aid and collaboration. But during this 12,000 years that humans have built forms of civilization and spread across the planet, we had not begun to destabilize the life support systems of the planet until very recently in geological deep time scales. It's like the last you know, breath and second of the clock um, that we started to really mess with the planet's life support systems. If you can see that the, the now here, actually, that is much too thick of a line to represent the actual now. It's not to scale, it's much thinner. So in our time, particular ways of living and world making are endangering the survival of myriad species on this earth, including ourselves, and threatening to end life as we know it. And there's all these sort of infographics out there that will show you, you know, your, your so-called footprint or the carbon budget or give us multiple graphs to show. We're inundated with all sorts of images of, from the popular media of climate change. And it's quite terrifying. Climate change is irreversible. We are creating forces towards mass extinction at a rate that's never been seen before um, since the great oxidation event. Over millions of years, there's only been five mass extinctions, sorry, billions of years, excuse me. Only five mass extinctions in the span of the Earth's existence, and yet humans have already managed to do more damage at the outset of the sixth mass extinction than any other species or living organism since the cyanobacteria who set off the great oxygen oxygenation event 2.4 billion years ago, annihilating conditions for most anaerobic life and producing the oxygen rich atmosphere that our kind of life needs. So in the popular media, we see many images of climate change, starving animals, disappearing animals, but the cyanobacteria didn't just threaten their own niche. Humans on the other hand, have created a magnitude of destruction that threatens us as well. So that it's become popular to say during the pandemic, we are the virus as if human nature makes anthropogenic apocalypse inevitable because humans will be humans and that's just how we are. Well, we are entering the sixth mass extinction, but we have a window to act. We are becoming increasingly aware that we are on the brink of perilous irreversible tipping points and unleashing uncontrollable feedback loops that will bring immense violence and suffering. It, and in this, people often waver between a paralyzing game over fatalism and fantasies of rescue from ourselves by almost magical technophysis. The goals that we set for ourselves of keeping things within 2% C global warming have now been revised down to 1.5 and even that is unrealistic. In the face of this, scientists, scholars, philosophers, artists, and many other people have started to try to understand this new era, giving it different names, Anthropocene, Capitalocene, Plantationocene, Cthulhu scene, an age of entanglement, extinction of scene, necro scene, or my term, anthropo supremacy. The most common understanding of the Anthropocene is that we are now in a new geological epoch, an age of man. And I use the word man advisedly because for most of history, man literally did mean the, the gendered male, um, in which humans have become a force of nature ourselves. But what does that mean? if we are already and always have been a part of nature. We're all entwined. What does it mean if we are already always engaged in co-making the world along with myriad other species and life forms and entities and that it is our dominant ideology of the human, Anthropos, as separate from and above all of nature that is blinding us to the reality of our inextricable entanglement with the natural world of which we are one of many constituent parts. Debates over the starting points and whichever scene it is are all connected to identifying the perpetrator of this terrible violence or 
the etiology of this if it, if it, as a disease or an affliction. And again, this is a sort of another scale of our impact. We're inundated with it, these images and the overwhelming consensus across the scientific, social scientific arts, humanities and other scholarly disciplines is that the reality of the conditions of ecological disruptions caused by humans and their activities is pretty indisputable. Five minutes left. Um, Okay, so what's at stake is who is responsible and what is it about our dominant way of life of being human and the model of civilization that is breaking the natural systems of the world on which we rely for survival. But because we're actually a part of nature, not above it or outside it as we often imagine. So I'm gonna just talk about art now as a space of resilience in the last five minutes. Because our creative capacity to imagine new worlds means that we can make the world differently if we embrace intersectional forms of solidarity with all beings with whom we share the earth. Our popular culture reflects this binary of humans and nature with images of violent post-apocalyptic hellscapes like the Waterstar Desert World of Mad Max, Fury Road, or zombie apocalypse movies and TV shows that reflect our fear of contagion, the breakdown of civilization, the loss of agency, and dystopian images of techno fixes gone wrong, abound in snow Techno fixes gone wrong in clean airplanes. Flying above the middle of my top. Even a jet to halt global heating being up the freezing the planet instead of most of the class warfare breaks out uh, in the contained space uh, that's left on the planet. And also Maya, did, did you did you drop your mic? No, that's an airplane. Oh, Why sorry. Yeah, I said it, but no one could hear. So there are post-apocalyptic shows imagining our survival in the future. I will skip past those. So while our popular culture largely reflects and amplifies our widely shared fears and fantasies, most of them offer little in the way of genuinely transformative understandings of the causes of the mess we're in, or give us novel imaginings of how to be human. How are art and popular culture different in ways that can help us now to become resilient in the face of unfolding ecological catastrophe? And is there a difference that matters? I say yes. I'm gonna skip through the art that I was going to show to just say a few words about art. I can show this in the Q&A. This is by Jung Bo. And if visual, popular visual culture reflects the dominant ideologies, uncritically held assumptions, familiar myths and unfounded fantasies more often than not, popular visual cultures reinforce and amplify our unexamined prejudices and dominant ways of seeing the world without actually examining them or challenging them, let alone offering genuine alternatives. This is where the superpower of art offers us a way out of our fatalistic paralysis or unrealistic techno fix and paranoid fantasies. Uh, here is another artist, Tejal Shaw, and from her Making the Waves, which shows ecologies of care, sorry, between the waves, Ecologies of care in a post-apocalyptic genderless future or gen non-binary gender non-conforming future where dances on landfills embrace thriving in ruins. So while art takes myriad forms, uses countless different kinds of materials, what unifies art as a potent source of resilience is art's transformative capacity. Art does not merely represent the world that is or even just offer depictions of things in our world that reveal hidden truths. Art's transformative power lies in its ability to spark our creative capacity to imagine things, relations, ways of being and beings and whole new worlds that do not yet and perhaps will never exist. Art opens up a space of critical distance from our quotidian everyday realities. Art can offer us a site of encounter with the more than human world or other than human world or multi-species world of other beings in ways that defamiliarize all we thought we knew and understood, challenging us to see with different eyes, to occupy positions of radical empathy and to reimagine the nature of ourselves, our ways of being and belonging from our kin to our identity groups, to our societies, nations, and even our relationships to the, fam to the planet. Art can perform reversals, inversions, enact paradoxes and contradictions in ways that give us new vantage points on almost anything and everything, because art is not governed by rules or realism or practicality. Art triumphs in making us question all that we assumed as normal 
natural, legitimate, right, and even desirable. And indeed, that is what aesthetics really means. Beauty is but a tiny dimension of the aesthetic. Instead, art can help us see how the very order of things in our world, our identities, our beliefs, our dominant arrangements are contingent, overdetermined, and could be otherwise. Aesthetic paradigms make particular expressions of things seem as if they were universal. Aesthetic paradigms serve to normalize and naturalize uh, particular orders of our relations to each other, ourselves, our societies, political power, our economies, ecology, so that they seem inevitable rather than contingent, which is what they really are. Aesthetics are the shape that our sensibilities take and make us imagine that this is just the way it is, that this is normal and there's nothing we can do about it, whether it's good or bad. Aesthetics frame the horizons of the thinkable, the imaginable, the conceivable, desirable, and seemingly possible. Therefore, art has the power to strip away the cloaking device from an aesthetic paradigm, perhaps embedded in our popular culture or our politics and our ideologies, and to reveal its workings. Our Sorry, Maya, to, to, to interrupt, but uh, your, your time is, um, is, is up. So if you could wrap up, uh, okay. that would be great. great. Art has the power to offer space for new imaginings of the possible and questionings of the desirable. All right, last one. In our time of looming anthropogenic catastrophe that some call the Anthropocene, art can help us interrogate the dom dominant ideologies that blame this mess on humanity writ large as if we were all one unified monolithic collective agent acting in unison and show that this trope is a diversion that prevents us from seeing the deeper causal working that lie beneath the surface of our crisis, that a particular way of life related to capitalism and the histories of colonialism, racism, systemic racism, misogyny, patriarchy, classism, and speciesism, anthroposupremacism is at the root of our crisis and that to resolve it, we must somehow get beyond that. So art will open up the questions of possibility and help us imagine being human and making worlds and defining civilizations in new ways that hopefully don't violate our planetary boundaries and exploit nature to the breaking point the way our current systems do. I will stop here and leave the rest for Q&A and turn the floor over to Andy. That's, it's actually, uh, thank you very okay. much for that, Maya. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's actually uh, Piera who's, who's next. next. Oh, okay. Go, okay, Piera, welcome to the floor. Yeah, welcome, Piera. Okay, um, thanks for inviting me uh, to participate in this webinar, Ethan and Maya. Well, uh, let's get begin on the presentation right away to save time. Next. Next, please. Um, my 2019 work, Particle, um, next please. Uh, the slide please. Um, page three, please. My uh, 2019 work, Particle, is about a uh, blessing operation in the limestone quarry in Cambodia that operated by both local and international companies. The operation causes damage to the mountains and affects the lives of villagers. Um, from this image, um, you can see the shattered top of a mountain caused by the explosion of a limestone quarry. As I come from Southeast Asia, a construction boom in this region is driving demand for limestone, a key ingredient in cement that is derived from natural resource, such as dancing limestone mountain. It destroys 
the fragile eco um, ecosystem and has an impact on the livelihoods of people living in communities around the mountain. And this is why I chose limestone as the center of the theme. Next, please. I investigate extractive capitalism by examining the impact of cement plant in Sukmia Khanglek community in Kampot province, Cambodia. This community has been fenced off from the mountain that they have relied on for generations to provide them with food or medicine so that the limestone can be um, extract to use in urban development by the Cambodian Thai owned company. Next, please. Next. Uh, I spent um, several days in the community to film documentary by interviewing the villagers who were affected by the arrival of the company. And then I returned to Thailand to film an analytive scene in a different location. Um, from, from this image, in terms of artistic practice, I created a video that combines documentary and fictional narrative elements. Next. Um, the part of documentary of the video is about the impact of extractive capitalism on a Cambodian community. And the part of fictional narrative is about an anonymous man in a fictional room when the entire film is set against the limestone quarry. Next. Next. If you want to watch the entire video, you can get the link and password from the event website. Next. Next. And now I will show you a short excerpt from the video. Okay. Okay. From uh, from this image, uh, uh, is a quick lamb or can or calcium oxide. You can see uh, the quick lamb uh, all over the floor of the art space. Uh, next, please. Uh, because I want the audience to have a sensory experience with quick lamb, which appears in the video, and it is the major material for this project. Next. Next. In addition to the video, I work with my assistants to create painting and sculptures. I chose quick lamb, the main subject in the video as the main ingredient. So we made art objects from the material that are commonly found in our modern world. Next. Instead of using new fabric, we sew some cement packaging into a large piece of canvas and then paint it with color and mix with material that we use in the construction industry. Next. Um, beside the painting, I want to create sculpture that are both solid and fragile. So uh, I, I chose quick lamb as the main ingredient. As far as I aware, people did not use quick lamb to make sculpture because of its non-attensive uh, nature. But um, as a result, the process was time consuming, but at the end, we, uh, we could arrive at the white sculpture, um, just uh, which appears solid and heavy, but look fragile, just as I had envisioned. Next. And next, uh, for the next project, uh, 
where do we go from here um, in 2021? Where do we go from here investigate how capitalism mode of production affects the lives of ordinary people and the environment? Next. Besides, um, uh, because, because this project was created during COVID-19, I could not travel or conduct field research. So I spent a lot of time on the internet, reading news from around the world, reading books and collecting footage before rearranging and editing it for the video. Next. next. And next, I gather footage from a, a variety uh, source on the internet, including new reports, interviews, next, documentaries, and mix with my own new footage. Next. Next. I like to make videos that show how production in a capitalist world affects various aspects of people's lives and also cause social issues such as migrant workers, child labor, economic inequality, marine pollution, plant extinction, and global environmental crisis. Um, to me, I believe that if we work in ecological and environmental issues, we should not focus solely on raising awareness among individuals, as this may not be sufficient. In my opinion, I don't think we will be able to avoid talking about how to alter the capitalist mode of production, which is a major source of environmental problems. It also oppresses marginalized people as well as other living beings. Next. And I will now show you a short excerpt from the video. Okay, so um, the video begins with the coronavirus and ends with permafrost. I link it together by um, concluding with anthrax leaving the question of where do we go from here at the end, um, because um, I inspire uh, for permafrost that came from the news from Siberia. And next. I exhibit the video work as a video installation, which was screened in a box made of wood in the, log in the logistic uh, industry under yellow neon lighting in the art space. And next, next, ne next, and next. Besides the video installation, I work with my assistant to create etchings, drawings, paintings, and hand-drawn animation by using footage from the video. Next. This is the etching. Um, according to my research, nearly 600 plants have become extinct in the last 250 years. 
as a result of industrial production and climate change. And next, uh, this is the um, drawing of lichen, a fungus and an alka hybrid. Lichen grow in a variety of habitats, but they are sensitive to pollute environment. So I use lichen to represent like how air, water, plants, and living creatures are all interconnected. Next. Next. And this oil painting on canvas is also based on footage from the video work. Next. And that will be the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Pierrot, for, for sharing such uh, amazing art. You, you would, you might be, you know, interested to, to know that um, Indiana University is located in Southern Indiana, which is the kind of the capital of, of limestone in the United States. Um, you know, the, the landscape in this part of Indiana is littered with um, uh, limestone quarries. So I, I hope you can come and see them sometime. Oh, I would love to. Thanks, Ethan, for the information. Sure, thank you. Thank uh, you. And, and uh, last but not least, uh, Andrew Yang. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Ethan. And uh, yeah, thank you again to Indiana University for extending this invitation to talk today. It's so wonderful to hear the perspectives um, from everyone on this really rich topic. Uh, so I'm going to just start the presentation here. The art is the resilience as resilience in the Anthropocene. And, um, you know, I think as Maya already very eloquently discussed, you know, there's many names for this. And, and to me, the question of the Anthropocene really comes down to this anthropo, right? Uh, what kinds of humans are we? I think Anthropocene is a descriptive term, but I think the next question then becomes like, what kind of humans, whatever this we, we are, what kind of humans do we want to be? Uh, and do we want to be even more than simply human? And I think this gets to Maya's question around, you know, a multi-species kind of awareness. And so, I think, you know, in terms of the language we might use to aspire, as Maya mentioned, there's the Catalocene, the Chulocene, uh, the extension of scene. Uh, I really like the term of an Australian sustainability expert named Glenn Albrecht, and he's coined the term symbiocene, because I think the real thing to aspire to and the, the kinds of things I'm interested in this theme of resilience has to do with like, how does one live together with others? And those others expanding far beyond just our own human communities, but all the non-humans we also dwell with. And so if you look at an image like this from Natural Geographic, it might look like the flight patterns, right, of uh, intercontinental flights going from North to South America, and then the dotted cities. But in fact, these are the, some of these are cities, but um, these are the flight paths of birds that migrate North to South uh, every year on a seasonal basis. And these different flight paths uh, are, you can see in the legend are shorebirds, seabirds, land birds. And uh, one of these, what they call flyways, actually goes through the city I live in, Chicago. And it's called the Mississippi Flyway. But one thing you'll see in spring and fall quite often are birds like this sort of on the ground. Um, this happens to be a, a juvenile robin. And the question is like, wow, what's happening? Why do these sort of dead birds start appearing at very specific times of year? And the culprit actually is uh, one thing that Chicago is really known for, which is the skyscraper. Because uh, through a bird's eye view <laughs> flying through the air, when you come to a glassy building like this, you don't see the building, you see the reflection of the sky below, behind you. And that looks like open sky. And so birds have tendencies to fly into these buildings being confused by the reflectivity. Or at night, when they're also migrating, they might be confused by the transparency and be drawn to the light, since the moon is one form of navigation that birds use during their migration. And so, you know, Chicago, as supposedly the most light polluted city in North America, has this sort of um, double dose of hazard for migrating birds in terms of its, you know, epic architecture, as well as the fact that it just uh, has light every way right in the middle of the Mississippi Flyway. So you'll find these birds, this happens to be a thrush that I found as well, again, um, all over the city and all, all you know, throughout cities in the Americas uh, in the fall and spring during the migration season. I just wanna show these other pictures of ones I found in downtown and you just to show like the speed and the impact at which these birds hit the buildings. I mean, here you can see um, 
this bird has actually broken its beak upon impact, where the other one has broken its skull. But it's not all bad news. I mean, some of these birds actually, um, well, some of the, the birds I ended up seeing, because I also happen to be a research associate at the Field Museum of Natural History, I actually came across um, at one point the bird lab at the Field Museum, and I noticed that they were at the bird lab every Wednesday getting whole bags full of birds like this. And I was like, where are these birds coming from? And it connected a really interesting dot for me because I came to learn that all these birds are being collected um, and then brought to the museum to be part of the museum's collection, but they're collected by volunteers. And in this case, the Chicago Bird Collision Monitors, an all volunteer group of people who go throughout Chicagoland in the early morning hours, uh, right, uh, pre-dawn and pick up birds in hopes that some of these birds that have hit buildings actually are still alive and can be brought to rehabilitation centers. And many of them are but the birds that don't survive these impacts um, are brought to the Field Museum uh, in the way I just showed you before. And one thing I became interested in was in seeing all these birds and recognizing my own experience and coming across them was about what that bird represented. Because of course there's a tragedy in the singular death of these beautiful birds. But then I was also remi reminded of a conversation I had with someone else about like, um, and I'm also trained as an ecologist, uh, you know, that birds aren't singular in their nature, right? That we're all interconnected. And so I asked uh, Dave um, right here in the corner, uh, Willard, the emeritus bird collection person, <clears throat> hey, have you ever looked inside these birds? Uh, could you, could I look at their stomachs? And so he said, sure, go ahead. We throw the stomachs away when we collect the birds. And so I took a bird stomach and I opened it up and lo and behold, it was full of seeds. And this is kind of what I thought might be the case because um, in thinking about these birds migrating, um, especially in the fall, I was thinking about all of the fruits they're eating, all of the fall harvest, and all of the ways in which plants are actually trying to make their own way through the landscape by enticing animals to eat them, ingest their seeds, and then disperse those seeds to the landscape. So I came to think about how it isn't just the death of the bird, of course, it's it's another kind of ecological interruption and rupture that's being created because it's also the other species that are mutualistic with the bird, including all of the plants that are going with it. So I started collecting these seeds, not knowing exactly why, <laughs> um, because I was interested. So each box here represents an individual bird of an individual species caught at a certain time, uh, collected at a certain time by the collision monitors. And I, and I accumulated them and I was thinking about how one could sort of make sense of or visualize even for myself what was going on and to try to visualize this larger ecosystem that was at stake. And so I sometimes would lay out these seeds from individual birds and in patterns, something like a 19th century French style of natural history. Um, and then sometimes I turn some of these images into postcards. That's the front and that's the back. And then in that sense, the cards could kind of symbolically fly, the seeds could can symbolically sort of fly again and disperse themselves to the landscape. But then I started to think much more materially about the question and started to actually put clean seeds back into bird feeders um, with the idea that birds could sort of re-ingest these seeds and, and try to redistribute them in the landscape to sort of follow their own desire line. And the project became known as the Flying Gardens of Maybe because in a sense then that's what these birds represent are these flying gardens of possibility for any given seed and plant to sort of make their way in the landscape. And then I started to think about how to visualize this and share it for others, though, in a much more explicit way. And so with this hermit thrush, um, what could I do with these seeds? Well, these seeds, of course, like have a raison d'etre to, to sprout. And so I started to try to grow them. I would throw, I would make um, flower pots out of ceramic and glaze the pots in the feathering patterns of a specific species of bird, in this case, the hermit thrush, and then grow the seeds from a hermit thrush that I found in that pot to see what would grow. And so this is an example of one of these gardens of maybe, and then have succeededly done this with many different kinds of birds through seeds I've collected. This is a white-throated sparrow on the right. There's a Canada goose here on the left. I think that might be a pepper plant of some kind. There's a cedar waxwing on the right and have proliferated this garden sort of ongoing uh, to sort of flesh out this kind of um, ecology that we're all embedded within. but you know, in talking to what Maya said about the quotidian realities uh, uh, that we kind of ignore, that we're sort of, uh, that we take for granted. And I think for me, one thing in these art practices that I'm trying to get at or through these projects is to have us take a little less for granted, to try to re-engage through aesthetics and 
and understand the ways that we are entangled with many other species and then how can we engage with them? How can we have new forms of care and how can we create new forms of visibility, right? Um, and so there's many different iterations of this project in different ways it's displayed, for example, in an art context or otherwise, the projects are meant to be able to be shown in many different ways. In this case, it's a photograph on the ground um, on a pile of bird seed. Uh, but if you're interested, this project is long running and the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History invited me to extend it and work with their bird collections labs to collect seeds from their birds. And so there's a version of this project that includes Chicago and Washington DC birds and their seeds at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History right now to, to March of next year in an exhibition called Unsettled Nature, Artists Reflect on the Age of Humans. So a very appropriate, I think, theme for this talk. Quickly in the time I have left, and I know I'm at eight minutes now, I just want to uh, mention another project that is along this theme. So you might not be familiar with this fish, although many people like I know in China are, right? This is called the Asian carp. Asian carp is actually four different species of carp that have um, come to be a part of the Mississippi River. And this project is born out of a commission that my friend Sarah Lewison and then Maya Koskaya and others were involved in large scale project called Mississippi, the Anthropocene River that was funded by the German cultural institution, the House of World Cultures, or the uh, Hakabe. And so one thing that really interests me about um, the Mississippi River and living in Chicago is that, of course, the sh Chicago is here because of the Mississippi River. If you look at the history of trade and the reasons for settlement, the connection between the Great Lakes and the Gulf of Mexico is one of the reasons for Chicago even being here in the first place. And we have a map here of this sort of spread of the Asian carp by its name, it's not a native species, it's considered invasive um, to the Mississippi watershed. And invasive because they're very good at reproducing, they, they kind of, in some sense, people say take over, they certainly dominate, they make use of, right, the um, conditions of the river and are, you know, uh, are very fecund. So in this case, you see bunches of them jumping at once when the water is electrified or when a mo boat motor goes by, they get startled and you see them jump just to visualize this. So Sarah and I took on a long, uh, about a two year long project to really get to know the Asian carp because there's also a worry about the Asian carp invading the Great Lakes. In fact, Michigan and Wisconsin at different times, I think are still suing the state of Illinois to try to get us to close our canal that leads from the Mississippi to the Great Lakes in hopes of stopping the Asian carp from quote unquote invading. Right now there's an, an underwater electric fence keeping them from entering. But there's something to the way we even talk about this and I've been talking about it. Here is a wanted poster of an Asian carp that a Department of Natural Resources put out. Here's another one and here's yet another. You see throughout the internet, this sort of like wild west wanted dead or alive, the Asian carp, right? The fish that's sort of criminalized for the fact that it's actually very successful. I mean, Americans brought the Asian carp here as laborers to clean uh, catfish ponds. They happened to have escaped during a flood and then uh, have perpetuated themselves throughout the Mississippi, but we seem to demonize this fish. And Sarah and I got really interested in what kind of relationship do we want to have with this species? Does it need to be so kind of right um, confrontational? So here's Sarah looking through uh, a fresh catch of some Asian carp at a place called Fin Gourmet in Paducah, Kentucky uh, that we've researched. Another person at uh, uh, an uh, another fishery in Kentucky. We went around, we interviewed, we engaged with different people who are actually um, collecting this fish for the purposes of food. Because right now, uh, the picture I showed you before, a lot of these fish are, are captured and simply thrown into landfills because they're trying to decrease the numbers. And, and Sarah and I are like, well, why do we take this wasteful approach to what is actually also a natural resource? The Asian carp isn't going anywhere. It's becoming naturalized to the US. They will never be eradicated from the Mississippi watershed. And so um, in that case, it's a question of how do we adapt? How do we coexist? And one of the best ways to potentially do that is actually to eat Asian carp. Uh, they're very, very tasty. They're very high in omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, they're very low in fat. They're exceptionally sustainable because there's, they're very abundant. And so part of the work in Fingor maybe worked with and part, this multimoded project was to sort of almost have a PR campaign in the sense for the Asian carp and to engage local communities around the Mississippi to reconsider their relationship to this other species and fish as something that isn't a, a piece of trash to sort of be removed or a threat to be um, battled, but something to sort of adopt and you know come to new sort of ecological terms with. So here, Lula Lou and John Creeley run Fin Gourmet in Paducah. And here um, they're helping us 
Liu Wei, a 200 person um, Asian carp taco dinner for a bunch of environmental activists uh, down in Carbondale, Illinois, uh, to try to get them interested in this being an aspect of actually activism, that it isn't just about sort of keeping a purity around the idea of what nature is, it's about us as fundamental parts of nature and and reestablishing different kinds of connections to it. So we had this dinner and you can see these placemats that we had um, that actually tease out some of the ideas about the Asian carp as you're eating. Um, fishing for nutrition, it talks about all the benefits of the Asian carp, but it also points to this other theme that Sarah and I were really interested in. Again, the idea of like the Asian carp. You know, it turns out that we call here in the Midwest, the common carp is another carp that was introduced in the 1800s. The common carp actually used to be known as the German carp because German immigrants bought it there from Europe uh, to the Midwest. And so my question becomes, you know, what about the Asian carp? I myself am an Asian American, and I really wonder about the ways that we almost politicize through our language um, and create these other kinds of relationships um, that are more global than they are planetary around how we think of other species and how we metaphor um, make them metaphorical to humans. So uh, Sarah and I create a a uh, billboard campaign in Southern Illinois to also bring a different kind of visual language, because that's what Maya also talked about around the Anthropocene. And so we had this billboard, Mississippi River, European carp, 1883, Asian carp, 1973. Those are the years they were introduced, now all American. <laughs> um, and we put them in various places throughout um, Southern Illinois to try to, uh, try to just shift people's perspective on, on what this fish really represents and what kind of resource it can be. Eat the river, heal the river, Asian carp, Midwest superfood. And then we also, and I know I have only a minute left, but I'll just say quickly that um, we then also had Asian, kite, cart, uh, Asian carp kite workshops using the idea of a konobori or a Japanese sort of carp kite. We um, invited people at community centers in Southern Illinois to make carp kites that were part of a parade and then use that as a workshop to actually educate people about the Asian carp as a food item, as an ecological threat, as something to, it was a, as a species to, that we by necessity have to coexist with today. And so one part of this, again, I, I said was being made for this parade called the All Species Parade that's held in Carbondale every year. And I just wanna quickly in the, my last minute say, one thing that's interesting about the All Species Parade is that it's supposed to celebrate um, those species that are threatened by extinction or endangerment by the Anthropocene, right? Uh, and um, so we asked, so it's, there's lots of monarch butterflies, there's lots of pandas, there's lots of cheetahs. And we said, could we have Asian carp as part of the uh, parade? Uh, can we have this workshop? And that actually generated a really rich and interesting discussion among the organizers. Well, no, that's actually one of the problematic species that's causing the endangerment of the ones that you know we care about, like the. Um, you know, like other fish of the Mississippi. But then I said, well, it's an all species parade. If it's an all species parade, shouldn't all species be included? And so this idea then became like, well, yes, you know, maybe this isn't just the Anthropocene. Maybe this is the Symbiocene. Maybe there's something about the collectivity of the way we think about species, where there's a space even for this um, fish that we consider such a problem. And so I just wanted to close there on this idea of trying to have practices that engage in a multimodal way, different kinds of people to sort of reframe uh, their own pre-existing narratives around um, the way we coexist and the nature that we don't just trash or destroy, but we're actively a part of. And how can we be an active participant in a way uh, that contributes to new kinds of resilience and perpetuity and continuity rather than just like the fear you know, of, ex of destruction. And then I'll just say in the end, um, please come visit, uh, there's a, a relevant exhibition I have right now that's just launched online called Making Kin, World's Becoming. Um, you can go to makingkin.net and look at the artists that are also sort of part of the symbiocene idea. And there, if you happen to be in Chicago, the Earthly Observatory, which is a show I co-curated as well, that's at the Sullivan Galleries at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago on these themes. So thank you for your time and sorry for running over. Thank you uh, so much, Andy, uh, for that. I just I love how you both you and um, and Pierre had sort of walked us through the the artistic process um, that, that made you know people people like me you know non artists um, you know better able to appreciate um, uh, all of your contributions. So in in our remaining uh, time, um, I'll allow the um, the panelists to we'll kind of one by one. Uh, give them an opportunity to address the questions in the Q&A uh, box. We can start with um, Dora Napolitano's question about, you know, how 
how can we you know, realize the potential um, of art if it's inaccessible to, uh, to so many uh, people? And why don't we just go in the same order? And you know, each panelist can maybe spend a minute or so uh, answering uh, that question. So Maya. Actually, I think that, that the presentation uh, that Andy gave gave some ex very clear examples of how, in fact, art does not have to be consigned to a white box or a museum or a gate kept by tickets or something that only, you know, elites or people with art cultivation can access, but rather that there's all kinds of art that is directly engaging with communities, whether it's citizen scientists like the the collision monitors or with you know people just who want to eat healthy food or people marching for other species engaging in different kinds of dialogues across myriad spaces um i think we need to get rid of the idea that art is an object that can be bought and sold that's only one very small part of what art is um thinking about art as an interface between different voices and different beings, if it's a multi-species kind of art, uh, creating encounters and possibilities to engage with the more than human world is another way that art, even in a museum or a, a white box space, can sometimes uh, lead us to see things differently. Like um, on October 14th, I'll be giving a talk with the eco philosopher Timothy Morton, um, together with an artist from China, Jung Chung Bin, who has created a site-specific installation at the San Francisco Asian Art Museum in an atrium with uh, what are sort of perforated sheets that, that are like a filter or a mesh through which light passes. And the, the, the installation itself is not the physical materials there. It's the actually, the artwork comes into being when it is intra-actively engaged by the viewer. The viewer's eyes, they move their body, they engage. and that the, the agential qualities of light, light flowing through this obstructive grid creates a myriad waves of iridescence, like rainbow patterns, just like you have oil on water or taffeta. When you move, you make the rainbows move and you see the way in which light is an active force, not just sort of something passive that's out there, but it is something that's all around us engaging with us. It's not only living beings, but all material in the world actually has a place and, and, and function in our world. And so it's encountering the embodied experience of those things and becoming aware of that through art is another way in which we can take art away from this sort of commercial object for sale and let it be something that teaches us who we are as more than merely simply human, as Andy said. Um, what do you guys think? about how to art can access uh, people beyond the, I mean, I think Andy gave examples of it through his own work, but what about, Kim, what about in, in Thailand? Um, are there art interventions that help people engage with these questions outside of institutional spaces? Oh, yeah, there are, there are um, some significant projects you know, that um, like a Chiang Mai social installation that um, occurred in the, the year 90s. Yeah, but, but like a, at the time, um, Thailand uh, didn't have any art space and museums. Yeah, so um, Chiang Mai artists and they invited um, um, scholars, uh, activists and foreign artists Allow the world or uh, who are in the network, uh, also communities to like uh, to work together. But I think the context uh, is different from you know the what what Andy uh, is doing for his project. Oh well, one thing I wanted to say is that and to this thing is so that there's many different ways to engage I think out of the art gallery or museum context so some artworks might be shown in places uh, that aren't art spaces uh, like you know an environmental activist conference or a billboard or but 
even though, for example, you showed many beautiful museum or gallery images, Pirat, the fact that your research involved going to these communities, doing the documentary film, interviewing people, is itself a really important intervention in the art making process. And I think it's often neglected, right? Your art isn't just the final product. The art is the whole process by which you come, right? to understand this topic and to engage people who otherwise would not be engaged and who get to speak about what they do as in a limestorm quarry or in a village, right? And so that's certainly an important part of these projects too, is getting people in the museum or volunteers to be like, wow, I hadn't ever thought of that perspective. We, maybe we shouldn't throw away these bird guts. Maybe we should do a study on the stomachs too, right? And so your work, even in these the films, I think is really doing that work. It's just not always very visible. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, to very quickly um, in, interrupt the, the conversation for a, a couple of seconds, just, just to say that um, the officially scheduled event concludes at three o'clock uh, Eastern. It's now three o'clock Eastern. Um, the, the panelists uh, and I will, will stick around. The audience, audience members are welcome um, to stick around and continue the conversation for another uh, 10 or 15 uh, minutes or so. But, but for those of you who have to leave, I just want to thank, thank those of you who came. If you, if you have to leave now, thank you very much for coming. There's a bunch of wonderful questions and comments in the chat. I don't know if you can all see them um, that are, we can, we can discuss, I think, uh, bring some wonderful questions together. Um, there's one by Stephanie Kane that I think is a, a very well-formulated question, which is, is it possible that our reliance on species as a conceptual category multiplied undermines the symbiosing thinking, even though it works as a vehicle for meaning across science, policy, and art? It's a really sophisticated and interesting question. Um, do you guys want to comment on that? And I have some thoughts about it, but I'd hear from the artists first. Uh, I mean, I'll say quickly, I think that's what in part I was trying to point to with that slide about, you know, who uh, do we, um, what kinds of humans do we want to be? And the question is, of course, who even is that we and do we want to be simply human, right? When we call ourselves something, we individuate. And the question is, you know, but we, we recognize our communities and we recognize other human community members, but why wouldn't we then acknowledge the non-human community members or why you know, there's a term I recently had a Scott Gilbert, who's a developmental biologist, come give a talk at and a course I'm teaching about symbiosis here at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And he talked about the holobiont, the holobiont being the idea that even any given individual is like, right, a multitude of different kinds of collectivities, right? Your whole microbiome and all the bacteria and fungi that live with you uh, mutualistically. So that, that that's the embodiment, quite literally, of the symbiocene and symbiosis. And so I really agree with Stephanie's question, you know, I think that that reliance is a real problem. I think the way where we individuate is, is both a cause and a symptom, you know, of these Anthropocene kinds of ways of thinking. I think one way that we can also uh, bridge the gap there, and I think it, actually the example of the birds and the seeds and seed dispersal is an example of that is that we shouldn't think of species in this isolated vacuum like context ourselves or any other species but think of them as immersed in webs of life and um, looking at seed dispersal done by birds or the possibilities and the possible futures that are suddenly disrupted with the death of those birds by things that are not normally there the skyscrapers that are not natural, but are human artifacts that uh, rupture the, the possibilities of life that would have gone on and spread for myriad different species, not just the birds, but the, everything that connected to the birds and, the, and the, the creatures that ate the plants that didn't grow, that, that died in the bird's stomachs, for example. And, and, and then I'm thinking of the way that, that Piara's work really focused on the role of capitalism and extractive capitalism in rupturing relations of embodied knowledge to the natural world. So the people who are the you know, or, original residents of the mountain who had a, a, an engaged embodied long-term relationship with the medicinal plants, with uh, the, the mountain that they lived with and saw as their home and part of their world as the mountain is, is privatized by neoliberal global capitalists and by you know, big companies and government joint ventures, 
and then turned into a mining site, which is one of the most ecologically destructive things you can do, the people whose lives and livelihoods depended on living with the mountain, that relationship is ruptured by capitalism and they're forced to go and work menial, poorly paid manual labor jobs that they know are destroying their world that they share with the other species of the mountain that they normally relied on. And yet they're given very few choices because there are no other options. When their livelihoods are taken away, they're literally forced into this wage labor relationship with the mining companies. So maybe perhaps we're not just thinking about species and ecology alone, but thinking about what Jason Moore talks about as capitalism in the web of life and thinking about how the Anthropocene is enacted through the particular way that capitalism puts nature to work and then pretends that that work has no value, that it doesn't have to pay the cost of the externalities, the damage that the, the, that the projects and infrastructure industrial developments of capitalism bring into being, that those can be omitted from the balance sheet and not considered as part of the equation of profit and progress. And Jason Moore's uh, theory of the cheap nature strategy of capitalism basically tells us that we need to look at how this artificial binary relationship of nature and society creates the possibility for the exploitation, not only of all of the natural world, right, but also of human beings who are then classified as part of the natural world, as not fully human, so people of color who are enslaved indigenous people whose worlds were de decimated by geno colonial genocide, you know, uh, women who were enclosed into the domestic sphere whose bodies were used for reproducing the labor force and so on. All of these forms of value production that help build the worlds we actually live in through capitalism strategy of cheap nature are rendered cheap or devalued, not seen as having any value at all, even though in fact, it's exactly the opposite capitalism relies on, completely relies on the ability to extract value from nature without paying the price for it. And so we've reached a place now called the end of cheap nature. There are no more frontiers that we can keep moving to and exploit, uh, you know, and, we have to confront the fact that the idea that, that nature is this free gift, this limitless resource that we can just take and take and take and never give anything back to because somehow we're not part of it. Mm -hmm. When we reach the end of cheap nature, we realize that that is a fallacy. And now we are forced to confront how capitalism mm -hmm. has transformed humans relationship to both ourselves and to the natural world. And if we want to change things, that may be one place we have to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, that's where I think that the, the films of Period are so, are so powerful that way, because I think people yeah. often think about that in terms of, well, other animals or plants, but then that's also just as true for uh, these landscapes, for the limestone, for the, you know, people have a tendency to think, well, that's infinite, that's just rocks. But of course, I think what your work is showing is that it's much more than that, right? There's an elaborate series of connections uh, that exist even in something as simple as sand, <laughs> you know, uh, that, that have like, you know, uh, there's a huge market for, there's a huge demand for that's directly connected to urban growth, um, but that has like a multitude of different kinds of impacts for humans and non-humans ecologically. So we, we think about these things in a very generic and, and singular way, right? Well, that's just a rock, so that's not a problem. But I think your work is showing the extent of that, right? It's an expansive nature. It's a real ecological view. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Naya. Yeah, I mean, I've learned a lot by working with artists mm -hmm. because I see when artists defamiliarize the stuff that we're so used to just sort of taking for granted um, and thinking this is just how things are, this is just the way things work. Artists break that familiar frame or put things in a context that makes us go, wait a minute, actually, these are contingent arrangements that don't have to be this way, that there are other ways that we could organize ourselves in our world. And if we're going to 
survive the Anthropocene or deserve to survive the Anthropocene, perhaps we need to really begin to reimagine what it means to be human in a more than human world that exists inside our guts, that exists all around us in the ecosystems, not, none of which we can even live without or survive without. And rethinking how we value things, rethinking the dependencies that we have on myriad forms of beings in the natural world, which are systematically denied so that it's palatable for us to exploit, extract from, and uh, to justify living in a, an extremely violent relationship to the world of the, of the other than or more than human, right? Imagining new ways to be a person and I think also has to start with imagining new ways to define what a good life is. Does it have to be about, you know, working for a company that you hate to buy stuff that you're going to throw away or don't care about to buy a big, uh, you know, building to store a whole bunch of stuff that you, you know, don't use after the first few months you have it to accumulate, 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 consume, 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 because our lives are completely occupied by this process and cycle. Or are there things that are actually more important to us that don't require or necessitate just violence against the other beings that we rely on to survive? Yeah, and I think that that raises a really interesting question about what would constitute ecological art. Is it just, yes. going back to your visual culture comments in the beginning, right? It's like, is it just about that these are ecological topics or there's something about the way the work is made that has to enact <laughs> those values and those ethics, right? So there's, a, I think, a renewed and interesting uh, interest in like Aristotelian virtue ethics and other kinds of approaches that aren't just about what's right, right or wrong to do or how, how many people benefit the most, right? <laughs> it's about um, how to do this in a way that's like uh, humane or not just human, but humane and through and through, right, um, consistent with a kind of way of life as opposed to just having a certain kind of outcome, right? Because every moment is its own outcome. So I really appreciate this idea of thinking about process much more seriously rather than the expectation of uh, a means to an end, you know. Are there other questions from the audience? And we have about, um, so look, Stephanie Kane has asked uh, uh, another uh, question and where I'm afraid that we're gonna have to uh, end this um, for good uh, at 3.15. So okay. if, um, if our panelists could, um, could take a stab at it quickly, that would be great. Well, maybe I can just uh, leave us with a couple of thoughts about where do we go from here? Because Piara really raises that great important question. All of this really comes back to the what is to be done question, right? How, how do we face the future, not only through art, but through our everyday lives? And how do we escape from the sort of violence of these, you know, dualisms that negate the intrinsic value of non-humans so that we can reunite with a natural world that we're actually already and always a part of? Um, and, I, and I think, for me, I think part of the answer to that is that we need to undo this dominant mode of being human that is anthropo-supremacist. So we know white supremacism, right, posits that, that the only you know, real valuable humans are white people and that how toxic and, and, and violent that ideology is. That ideology takes its logic, as does other forms of oppression based on gender or class, takes its logic from a deeper and, and more his, historically ancient division or rupture of the human with our animal selves, with our natural world, a radical devaluation and exclusion of an othering of the non-human or the more than human or the other than human world that makes it possible, thinkable, desirable, as, again, an aesthetic paradigm, right? That makes it logical and palatable and seem necessary that we exist in a relationship of rupture and exploitation. And perhaps 
if we understand that anthropocentric supremacism actually subtends and enfolds, underpins and lends its logic to other forms of human oppression, like patriarchal misogyny, white supremacism, and which are underwritten by the logics of anthropocentric supremacism, right? Then we can start to understand the intersectionality of social justice for humans and the more than human world. So we can't actually solve any of these problems isolated and, and separately, but rather that we need to look at how the, the, the wider fabric of living and being in the world uh, as different kinds of humans and as different kinds of life or forms of beings is all woven together. And think about how to eradicate the sort of anthropo-supremacist presuppositions of our somehow our superiority that gives us the right, the sovereign right to exploit and extract even to death, destruction and extinction, any other being that is not qualified as us, including myriad humans who are also dehumanized in order to make them available for exploitation as well. I mean, if you think about how dehumanization is a violent ontological negation, of the value of human beings, right? Dehumanization made enslavement sinkable for people um, and has made, you know, the uh, genocide of indigenous people somehow conceivable or even seem necessary or at least justifiable for colonizers. And yet that dehumanization is violent precisely because of the assumption that animals and non-human beings have already been centered from humanity and have already been defined as unequivocally inferior, right? And thus without any intrinsic value of their own, except that value which comes from what they can produce when exploited to satisfy human desires. So I think reimagining the human in a more than human world is a necessary first step towards healing the wounds inflicted by only a particular subset of humans and their dominant mode of civilization on all of quote unquote nature by, that includes all the humans who are categorized as nature in order to exploit them as well. So if human exceptionalism, speciesism, human supremacism, anthropocentric supremacism, white supremacism, systemic racism, patriarchal misogyny, classism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, heteronormativity and other forms of oppression, if we see the common logics that, under, that undergird them and, and mobilize them as forces of, of violence in, and oppression in the world, then perhaps we can also see how solutions to these problems must necessarily be intersectional. And that intersectionality has to also be interspecies if it's going to actually solve the problems that our world is now facing. Um, I made a list of a bunch of great readings that I was gonna share. If anybody wants a copy of the presentation, I've got a bunch of readings uh, and books that are worth looking into if you're interested in these kinds of issues that I'm happy to share with anybody so you can get the link through our wonderful hosts. And also please see the videos and the artworks through the links that are also provided by the artists so you can get to know their art practices much better than simply describing them. But um, I really thank all of you for coming and engaging in these conversations with us. And I'm sure we could talk for hours and hours about these questions without running out of important things to talk about. So I hope this is only the beginning and that you take these conversations with you to your friends, to other people and continue to question what does it mean to be human in a more than human world? What kind of humans do we want to be? What is to be done? How, where do we go from here? That was the perfect wrap up. That was, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Maya. Thank you, Pierrot. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks to our Mexico City team. And thanks to um, the, the audience, all of you who, who attended. Thank you for your great questions. Um, and and we, we, we shall continue the conversation. Lots to, lots to chew on. And, and thank you for giving us so much um, to chew on. And with, with that, that, that concludes um, our event uh, this afternoon. Thanks to all. And I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you so thank much. You, Ethan. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, yes. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah.